right, there were, I should have picked the other ones. There were a couple. They actually, some of the pictures, you can, I think it's safe for you to uh, Google baptism and look at the pictures that are on there. They actually had, I don't know if it's a priest, uh, whatever they were called. It was not like they were not dressed like we normally dress. They had on whatever, different garb. Had the baby holding it upside down. Was fixing to dunk that baby under the water. Under, I, I guess it was a vat of, I say a vat, boy, isn't that a good thing? Uh, a pedestal of holy water. I wanted to use that one. I thought, well, I better not. It was pretty funny. Wow. All right. I thought it was funny. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about baptism. You might be asking, why in the world are we talking about baptism? Over the last few weeks, I've had a couple of questions that have been asked of me that just led me to say, hey, we need to talk about baptism. And on that text I had on the, what I sent out on the thing was what, who, why, where, and how. We're going to address those questions tonight. Um, and I can turn that up for y'all a little bit. I see some of you grabbing coats. They recorded me. I can't say it loud. <laughs> I heard what was going on in the hall. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about baptism and these questions. How many of you have ever had a question about baptism? Ever been confused? Maybe why do we get baptized? What's the point of baptism? Those type questions. Well, hopefully tonight I will be able to answer those questions using the Word of God. And tonight, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3. And I want to read to you, and this is where we are going to follow in the steps why we do baptism and hopefully by the end of the night you'll realize that this is why we um, as Christians should be baptized um, but in Matthew chapter 3 we're going to start in verse 13 Matthew 3 verse 13 now John the Baptist to set this up John the Baptist is down at the Jordan River he is baptizing those that were coming and listening to his teaching those that were going to be disciples of his, that were going to follow him. And so John the Baptist is baptizing those in the River Jordan. And we pick up here, Jesus is coming to John the Baptist. Now, could you imagine being John and now the Savior of the world is coming to you to be baptized? I mean, John knew who Jesus was. They were cousins. And so, but now Jesus is coming to John to be baptized. And here we have this communication Starting in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John, John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? Basically, John's saying, whoa, wait a minute. You should be the one baptizing me. Why? I know I'm not going to baptize you. Trying to tell him, no, you should be baptizing me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Give you just a freebie here tonight, verses 16 and 17. If anybody ever asks you for proof of the Trinity, here's a proof of the Trinity. We have all three of the Trinity all, all at once at the same time right here. You have Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit that is landing on Jesus as a dove, and then the voice from heaven being God the Father, and they're all three on the scene at the same time. Three separate entities of the Trinity are right there. So you can use 16 and 17. Now, flip over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. I use that first passage to set it up tonight that we are following in the footsteps of Jesus when we talk about baptism. We're following in the footsteps of Jesus. And uh, did Jesus, uh, and we'll probably talk about this a little more in just a minute, but if Jesus was perfect, and was not in need of salvation, why was he baptized? There are some churches that teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. We don't teach that here. We'll get into that more here in just a little bit. But Jesus was leading by example. He was giving us an example, and we're going to follow as an outward sign. Again, we'll talk about that here a little bit more 
And this is why we teach that we are to baptize. Um, something we'll talk about too is how many of you have heard of triune immersion? How many of you have heard of that? I didn't hear about it until today when I was reading. Um, I was reading the paper that Tim had given me uh, that we have on baptism that, that they're doing for the new convert class. And I'd actually never heard that before. But triune immersion is what we believe, and we get it out of Matthew 28. Um, that's what some of those Christianese words that we use, but it's simply that we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We baptize a triune immersion, and then we dunk you all the way under. Um, but in Matthew chapter 28, um, I lost my place. We're going to be in verses 18 uh, through 20. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Doing what? baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, what we need to establish first tonight, what does it take for salvation? Anybody? What does it take? How do you receive salvation? salvation okay accept Christ in your heart do what yeah repent repent and trust in Jesus that is what it takes to have salvation baptism comes afterwards baptism is the outward sign that we are making a commitment to be a follower of Christ um, baptism was a sign that you were being baptized into that that you believed and we believe that there is a representation that as we baptize you, the old sinful self is buried. And as we rise and raise you up, it symbolizes that the new person is now here. Salvation has already happened or should have already happened. Uh, Brother Tim has made the statement before that if you go into that baptistry a sinner, a dry sinner, you just come out a wet sinner. If salvation hasn't happened before then, dunking you under the water does not do anything for you. It is just an outward sign. So we'll start tonight is what is baptism and what does it accomplish? We sort of talked about that. Baptism is our outward sign of obedience that we are following Christ. Being baptized does not save you. If Michael repents of his sins tonight and he decides that tonight is the night and he's not saying he's not a Christian, just using him as an example, but he says, hey, you know what? That message drunk, I want to give my life to Christ. He comes down and he says, hey, I want to be a Christian. And he gives his heart, he surrenders to the Lord, he repents of his sins, trusts in Jesus, and he acknowledges. And we're on our way up to the baptistry and he falls over dead. Was he saved? Absolutely. However, there are churches today that teach if he did not get baptized, he was not truly saved. That he is doomed to hell. Nowhere in scripture do we have that. There are verses that we'll look at here in just a little bit. Um, that I'll use that, that other churches use to try to say that you have to have baptism in order to be saved. Baptism does nothing but get you wet. It is an outward sign that we are in obedience following Christ. Your salvation has already happened before that when Michael knelt down Michael could be sitting right there and he could give his heart to the Lord right now without even coming to the altar when he gives his heart to the Lord he is saved it is at that moment now we believe that in obedience he should be baptized because he needs to make that public profession of faith to say hey I am a Christian I'm a follower of Christ um, who should be baptized everybody that becomes a Christian should be baptized uh, Philip, as he was walking, or he was walking along the road, comes up on the eunuch. Y'all remember this story? Philip comes up, asks the eunuch, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to read the word. And Philip says, hey, do you understand it? He said, how in the world can I understand it? Unless somebody explains it to me. The passage he was reading was talking about salvation, was talking about what Christ was going to do. Philip explains it to him. The eunuch says, hey, look, there's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he takes him down, he baptizes him, and then Philip is taken away to another town. 
How awesome would that be? I'm in McEwen, then all of a sudden God says, okay, Joshua, I need you in Dixon. Poop, now I'm in Dixon. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Okay, y'all are asleep tonight. Wow. Y'all wouldn't like that, to teleport just from here to Dixon? I don't have to worry about that red light down there? I don't know. Worry about how to get back. I got there. <laughs> if God could teleport me there, he'd teleport me back. But who should be baptized? Anybody that becomes a Christian, you should be baptized. But remember, baptism does not save you. It is a step of obedience that we take after we are saved. Salvation has already taken place. Now we're obeying Christ, and we're going to be baptized following in his example that we saw right there in Matthew chapter 3. Because if baptism is what saves you, that means Jesus wasn't saved until he was baptized, right? I mean, we could argue that point. Jesus was perfect. He didn't need salvation. He is salvation. Why should I be baptized? Same way. We've talked about that. It's an outward sign. You should do that as an outward sign to others. Usually you're doing it in the church. You're letting the church know that, hey, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, in that day, there was no church. When they were being baptized, they, were being, they would go down to the Jordan River or like the eunuch. We have no idea what body of water it was. He just saw a body of water and says, hey, can I be baptized right there? But for the most part, they were going to the Jordan where all uh, everybody out in the public that was out around that area would have seen them being baptized. And they knew by that person being baptized, they were saying that they were a follower of whomever they were being baptized by. And so that was an outward sign. Uh, churches have not always been here. Churches didn't come around until Constantine. Uh, if you look up in history, that's around 330, I think, or 360 is when churches began to be built, actual church buildings like what we have today. And actually, when they were built back then, they were a lot more ornate than what we have today. Where should you be baptized? Yeah, any body of water that I can get you all the way under? Some? Now, look, there are difference. They believe in uh, sprinkling. Have you all heard that? Sprinkling. They'll take their hand, dip it in water, and they just sprinkle it on your face, and now you've been baptized. We believe in complete immersion. Trust me, I was a wretched sinner. I need to be washed all the way. They need to hold me under for a little bit. Again, it's an outward sign. We believe in complete immersion. It's what Jesus did. We're following in his footsteps. When they were baptizing them, it was a complete immersion. They weren't standing in the Jordan River, and John was getting his fingers wet and splashing water on them. They were baptizing them. They were dunking them under. How should you be baptized? Again, we believe in triune immersion. That's why we say we baptize this our brother or we baptize this our sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus told us that we should do. Um, and that is why we do that. That's why myself, Brother Tim, or whomever it is that's doing the baptism, that is why they say what they say. They're doing it in that complete uh, of what Jesus said there in Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 and 19. Now, what I want to do is, and this is where we're going to spend more time, and this is basically, I was just giving you a rundown there of what we believe, what baptism is, and now there are some questions that are out there about baptism. We've talked about them a little bit tonight, but I want to go in depth on these um, because there's, here's where the confusion comes in, and these are some of the questions that I've been asked here recently. And the first one is this, is baptism required for salvation? How would you answer that? No, it is not required for salvation. If you want to point a scripture that you could look at, look at the thief on the cross. What did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Did he say, hey, wait a minute, we got to stop this crucifixion. We got to get him down, let's baptize him. Then you can hang him back on the cross. Then he can spend in paradise with me. No. So if he was going to be able to go, if baptism was required for salvation, they would have had to baptize that thief. And so it wasn't required. Um, it, it is an outward sign. Salvation is free. This is a sign of obedience. When we're baptized, when you are baptized, you're being obedient to what God has told us to do. It is an outward sign. 
no part of salvation, or sorry, no part of baptism saves you. Okay? If you go into that baptismal, again, if you go in there a sinner, you, a dry sinner, you come out a wet sinner. There's nothing about that water that saves you. There's nothing about what we do as pastors or what, you know, somebody does if they baptize you. There's nothing about what they do as they bring you out of that water that saves you. What saves you is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6. Y'all know what it is? Got it? Man, all of y'all should be able to say that. I say it all the time. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except by me or through me. It is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only way that we have salvation. Baptism is an outward sign. It is not required for salvation. It is an outward sign of obedience and so that's why we as a church we say hey you should be baptized because scripture tells us that that's a part of your journey but it's not a part of your salvation it is completely separate if you are saved and you were to die in a car wreck before you got somewhere and got baptized you're still saved you're not unsaved because you weren't baptized and there are churches and we have to be careful because there are churches that teach that you are not saved until you are baptized. Baptism is an outward sign of obedience. It does not have anything to do with your salvation. It doesn't affect your salvation, I should say. It has something to do with it because it's an outward sign of obedience. You're being baptized because you've been saved. Baptismal, this is another one of those big christianese words if you hear it baptismal regeneration and this is the fact they teach there are churches that teach that again you are not saved until you've been baptized then salvation is complete once you have been baptized what happens if that's true what have i done I've done something to deserve salvation. If baptism is required before it's complete, I've done something to earn it. There is nothing I can do to earn salvation. The only thing that is required of me for salvation is repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That is what's required of me. Baptism, but there are teachers out there, uh, pastors, churches, that they say that, hey, you baptismal regeneration, that's one of those big words. You have to be baptized in order to be saved. If you're not baptized, you're not saved. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yeah, you've now made it. It's a you've now made it. Just like Shane was saying, a works based salvation. There's nothing I can do to earn salvation. Again, baptism is an outward sign of our obedience of following Christ. Are there churches that teach that you must be baptized in order to join the church? There are churches today. We are not one of those. Well, on here it is we ask that yeah i mean if you're a christian we want you to be baptized but it's not that you have to be baptized in order to join our church if todd wants to be a member of hurricane chapel he does not have to be baptized here at hurricane chapel we'll ask him have you been baptized but it's not that he has to be baptized into this church and usually what happens with this when this is used as a tool for you to join the church it's so that they call that closed Um, closed membership and that is where you can only join the church if you're baptized into that church 
So when you could not be a member of our church unless me or Brother Tim baptizes you. And that's not in Scripture. What were the apostles doing? When they were joining the church, when they were being baptized, yeah, people were being baptized by the thousands, but they weren't being baptized to a specific church. This is extra things that man has added to the Word of God. And so you don't have to be, and it also what follows that is communion, because baptism and the Lord's Supper are some of the things that we use as a test of fellowship, and we here at Hurricane Chapel practice open communion. That means that anybody can come off the street. If they're a Christian, they can take, and we don't have any requirements other than that they be a Christian, because that's what the Word of God says. They don't have to be a member of this church in order to take communion. But there are churches that will use this and say, no, you cannot take communion at our church unless you have been baptized at our church. And so my question, again, I go back to the word of God. What were they doing back then? If they were practicing the Lord's Supper, they didn't have Hurricane Chapel Free Will Baptist. They didn't have First Free Will Baptist. They didn't have First Baptist. They didn't have the Presbyterian Church and, and these different places. They were all one body. And so man has come in and trying to use baptism as an extra command, an extra whatever you want to use it, an extra rule. So it's not required in order to join a local church. It's not of our church. Now, there are some churches that do require it. If you're going to be a member of their church, you have to be baptized. It doesn't matter if you've been baptized in 20 other churches. If you want to be baptized or be a member of that church, you have to be baptized into their church. Again, baptism is an outward sign of our obedience to God. Uh-oh, I might have hit too many clicks. Uh, we just, we've co covered that. I think my clicker's gone to sleep. It's slow like me. Oh, that's it? That would be why. I forgot that was my last slide. <laughs> Johnny, you laughed a little too hard at that. Hey, there are some things. Now, I know tonight, look, this was not a real uh, quick, this was not a long lesson, and, and some of you might be, look, I, I really didn't learn nothing. I hope that tonight I have answered your question. Here is, if I get nothing else home to you right now tonight, if you don't take anything else away from this message tonight, take this. Salvation is free. All you have to do is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. If you make that decision tonight, and the Lord calls you home, and you were never dunked under the water, you are still saved. However, maybe you're sitting here tonight, and this could be an adult, it could be one of you teenagers. You're sitting here tonight, and you have been saved. I want to challenge you, encourage you to be baptized. What's stopping you? It's an outward sign of obedience. Jesus did it. He set the example for us, and he told us, in his word now look if you've been baptized before you don't have to be baptized again in order to join our church or to be a part of our church that's not scriptural some of the verses and I wanted to look at these real quick uh, I'll give these to you if you want to jot these down some of the verses that they use and again I can take the Bible and I can take a single verse and I can make the Bible say anything I want it to say you have to take the verses of Scripture in context. What are they saying? If we take a single verse by itself, I can make the Word of God say anything. And I want to look at this one. Mark 16, 16 is one that is used a lot uh, in Mark 16, 16. Flip over there if you have your Bibles or on your phone. Mark 16, 16, if I can get there. And here's what Mark 16, 16 says. And I'm only going to read... Mark 16, 16, and you let me know what you think that verse is saying. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If I read only that verse, what do you think that says? Yeah. If, if I take that one verse, and this is one of the verses that's used. They use Mark 16, 16. And it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So it's saying that you have to believe and be baptized before you're saved. That's not what that verse is saying. As a matter of fact, that's Jesus that's speaking there. And 
This is where he's given the Great Commission. Um, but we have to take it in its entirety. If you go on to read what comes after that, and if you read what's before it, it lets you know that, hey, it's just telling you these are outward signs that you will do. He gives in Matthew. He was telling us that, hey, we go out and we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are some saying, there are churches out there that say, hey, we are not speaking in tongues because I have not been baptized in a certain way. I had a gentleman tell me before, uh, I worked with him. Uh, he came to church, and or, I'm sorry, he came to work, and uh, he said, well, you're not a real Christian because you haven't spoken in tongues. You haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus. I'm like, well, yeah, I have. I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, no, no, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And when you're baptized in just the name of Jesus, then you'll speak in tongues. And there are people that use, and they try to use Scripture, and they, they twist it around. Again, this is just an outward sign. It doesn't matter if I baptize you in the creek. It don't matter if I baptize you in a puddle out in the parking lot. If it's deep enough to get you under, baptism is an outward sign of obedience. Nothing about baptism saves you. You are just being obedient to God, okay? Um, another verse that they use is Acts 2.38. Turn over to that one real quick, Acts 2.38. There are others that I could share with you, but these two are just two that are really some of the most used verses to support that you have to have baptism in order to be saved, but they're taken out of context. Acts 2.38. And I want to ask something. How many of you students have a Bible with you tonight? I'm going to call you out. You need to have a Bible with you, whether it's on your phone or whether it's a hard copy like this. Adults, you should have a Bible, whether it's on your phone or whether it's here, because as I give you these verses, you can read them with me. You can see that what I'm reading is the truth, and I'm actually reading the Word of God and not making something up as we read it. It's important that you guys have your Bible with you when you come to church. Uh, Acts 2.38 says this. I'm, this makes it a lot easier if I put these on. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive a gift of, the gift of the Holy Spirit. If I read just that verse and that verse alone, what does it make you think about baptism? You don't receive salvation until you're baptized. That is not what Peter was saying when he was making that statement. When he was asked, another passage that they use is where Peter was preaching, and they said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized. And they want to take that and say, hey, well, see, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's not what that passage is saying. Okay? So we have to read the Word of God in its entire context what it what it is saying and when you look at john three sixteen, because there are other verses in scripture that talk about salvation that says it basically says that if you believe that jesus is the son of god and you trust in him for salvation that is all that's required that's it you repent you turn from your ways and you follow god you allow him to make you a new creation and you know that jesus is the only way that is what salvation that's when salvation happens at that point that you believe that okay any questions from you guys oh. If it was a requirement it would have been laid out that way god is not the author of confusion he has laid out the plan of salvation very clearly john three sixteen. can y'all say that so who is it that gets to have everlasting life and is baptized oh that's not in there no this i mean look here is Jesus talking, and like Pee Wee said, if it was such a, if that was a requirement for you to be dunked under the water, 
And yes, they use the passage where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, you have to be both born of water and of the spirit. We're talking about you got to be born from your mama. That's where the water comes in. And the spirit is when you're baptized, you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and fills you, makes you new. It is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that washes you and makes you white as snow. Yep. Yep. So being dunked under the water does not save you. Romans. So tonight, I wanted to, like he said, just share that with you because of questions that had I had been asked. And I want to let you guys know, look, we encourage you to be baptized, but it's an outward sign of obedience. Remember, baptism is an outward sign of obedience. There's nothing about it that saves you, okay? Nothing about us dunking you under that water. Uh, one of the questions that wasn't on there but that ha I've been asked before is, who can baptize people? There you go. Anybody can baptize. If you're a Christian, you can baptize. You do not have to be an ordained minister or an ordained pastor. You don't have to be an ordained deacon or elder of the church. Anybody can baptize. Scripture, when he says go and make disciples, he was taught, and it says teaching them to follow those commands. Anybody can baptize. Okay? So there's not that. It doesn't have to be a, a specific thing. We've had... Uh, other people ask we've had uh, uncles we've had friends that maybe it was their mentor that led them to Christ we've had them ask us if they could be the ones to baptize and brother Tim's like well yeah and he'll brother Tim will stand in and be there but it's okay for anybody I mean if you're out somewhere and somebody says hey I want to be baptized I've seen it happen uh, we've I've heard of stories of it happening at camp. I was at uh, Impact Camp one year, and we walk out, and they're in the fountain. There's a fountain right there. It was deep enough to baptize them. So they were baptizing teenagers that were saved. They said, I want to be baptized, and so they baptized them right there. I've heard of them at uh, stories of other places where they just walk down into the lake and baptize them right there. It doesn't have to be a specific person, okay? But any other questions?
And unless you study, you don't know it's complete immersion. I mean, in the Bible, it says that they took him down and when Jesus came out of the water. It doesn't say that John took him. We believe in complete immersion because we've studied. We've looked at, okay, what's the tradition? But if you don't do that, you don't know that it's complete immersion. And that's where some people get sprinkling. That's where some people get infant baptism. Uh, we didn't even get into that. Infant baptism, if it's not their choice, how are they being obedient to God? Now, you can dedicate your child. We dedicated both our boys. But ultimately, they had to make their decision. When we dedicated them to the Lord, it did not save them. What saves them was when they became of that age of accountability, whatever that was, when they understood and they repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ. It is only through the shed blood of Christ that you can be saved, not being dunked under the water. Like he said, you're now entering in a third person. Somebody else had to help you get that salvation. And that's not the case. All right? Well, I hope tonight was gives you some information. If you come up with some questions, uh, you know, shoot them to me in a text or something. Um, or catch me wherever and just ask me. And we can talk about those. Um, but uh, let's close in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you for this. God, I thank you uh, that we can have times where we just talk about specific things. Lord, I, I pray that tonight that uh, baptism, that God, that it has been explained uh, correctly and that, Lord, it has been explained clearly. And, um, God, I just uh, I pray most of all, God, that we can trust in your word fully. And we know without a shadow of a doubt that there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. That, God, it's only through the shed blood of your son. And, God, I thank you that you paid that price for us. Um, and, Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I love you and I praise you. Pray that you'll be with us as we leave tonight. Uh, be with us throughout the rest of the week. Um, Father, I pray for this school in Texas. God, for all these families that have been affected by this shooting. Lord, what a tragedy. God, I pray that you will bring peace that only you can bring. Um, and Lord, we just pray for that community right now. Lord, we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.